The rest of you, I hope that uh, you're ready to have fun here in the Word of God tonight. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on. Y'all can do better now. Amen. That's a fun scary. Yeah, come on, brother. Help us out. That's, that's fun terrifying to a pastor or to a preacher when he's getting ready to come up and preach. And everybody goes, oh, good. <laughs> well, no boy, man. Come on, man. You guys remind me of that buzzer. Do you remember that story I told you about that buzzer? The bumblebee, 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 bumblebee. How are we going to be better than that? How are we going to be fired up? We'll come to church. Don't forget, Tim Revival coming up uh, August 24th through the 28th every night, uh, Monday through Friday from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, Pastor Travis Inman, Biblical First Church of God, Justin Duncan uh, with the Underground uh, College and Teen High School Age Ministry on Tuesday night. Uh, Wednesday night, Brother Dave Norris with Heaven to Bay Ministries. Thursday night, yours truly, Pastor Reno Bay with Momentum Community Church. And then Friday, Pastor Greg Locke will be uh, to deliver a, a very special word. Uh, again, he said that uh, he was excited to be coming here to Bedford uh, the last week of August. And I'm excited uh, that he'll be coming. If he had not got a chance, like I said, to catch his last uh, two-minute tirade. That's what I call him. I like him. Uh, he... Uh, he got called out on some masks this week, and uh, you may not like what he had to say, but I like what he had to say, so uh, I'll support him in his efforts uh, to just preach the Word of God uh, with much truth, and so excited uh, about that. Oh, I know what it is, I'm forgetting. Uh, remember, if you'd like to help us out here, don't forget the yard sale coming up August 1st. Uh, August 1st. From 9 a.m. until 4 p.m., we will be here at Momentum Community Church, weather permitting. Uh, if it rains, I believe everything will get set off for another week. But if it doesn't rain, we have stuff to fill the parking lot, uh, the whole downstairs, the hallway, the rooms, the kitchen. It is full of items that we have prepared for uh, the yard sale coming up on August 1st. And again, thank you uh, to all of you that have helped pricing, organizing. Uh, getting that stuff put together. If you'd like to come and help early uh, Saturday morning, please be here uh, early and help us get that stuff set out and prepare for the yard sale Saturday again. Uh, weather permitting, if it looks like we're not going to happen, be sure to get all that out on Facebook. Remember, if you'd like to help us here at Momentum Community Church, simply go to MomentumCommunityChurch.com and uh, it can lead you into past messages, tonight's message. Uh, they can also show you how to give digitally and securely online. You can also use your mobile device by texting the word Momentum CC to the number 77977. And there again, it will show you how you can give digitally, securely, online, one time, a reoccurring gift, however you would like to do that. We don't end up with your credit card information or any of that kind of stuff. That's all private and secured and insured through the FICA or whatever it is. Uh, if you'd like to uh, give in person, we have a drop box in the door. We also have offering buckets in the back, hand sanitizer and everything back there. Uh, feel free to give freely on your way out tonight or anytime through the drop box in the door. And if you'd like to send us a card with a love offering or something in it, or if you'd like to just send us a note to encourage us, uh, please hit us up through the Great United States Postal Service at Momentum Community Church, 1403 R Street, Bedford, Indiana, 474. Two, one. I think that's all I got tonight. You guys ready to hear the word tonight? Amen. Well, I got to tell you, uh, <clears throat> I have not, uh, I haven't known Jason uh, my whole life. Like uh, uh, some of you, I've known for large, large parts. Of Eric, I've known you since we was kids. Uh, I still remember that little old house uh, set across the road from Jiffy Tree down over in the in the golly down there. We wasn't rich, was we, brother? You look back at that house, I mean, the only thing that it was short of was having dirt floors all the time, man. But you know what? Everybody knew it was happy, wasn't they? Yes, sir. I carried a smile on her face. Well, uh, I haven't known Jason my whole life, but uh, he has been a blessing to us here at Momentum Community Church. Uh, he and uh, his wife, Mandolin, are expecting their eighth child uh, soon and very soon. Uh, that's a lot of kids. And so, uh, he needs a lot of support tonight, so if you don't amen him, I'm going to blame him if he throw that bottle of water at you. He probably got some stress. He needs to get it out. But uh, I'm glad that they have uh, made Momentum Community Church their church, and uh, I'm thankful that they're here week in, week out, and that they bring their beautiful children, and that they entrust us uh, not only with their spiritual lives, but with the spiritual lives of their children. I think that says a lot uh, about a couple when they put that kind of 
trust and faith. Boy, the sweat rag is calling my name tonight, huh? Well, listen, uh, I won't keep you guys any further uh, from hearing the word of God tonight. Brother Jason Regal, come on and give it to us tonight, man. Yes. Our first yeah. Back at, uh, I'll get into that part of my testimony here in a little bit, but I think I was around the age of 24 it's been at that time. Uh, I actually came into Lawrence County Jail in uh, the generation after uh, Reno and David and uh, Bobby Hillbarn and a bunch of others uh, went through there. But uh, Lawrence County witnessed one of the biggest uh, revivals I believe, at that time. A lot, of, a lot of people came out of their chains, a lot of people came out of their praise in the the God who changed them, and uh, it's uh, it was it's something that's needed very very badly Amen. nowadays in Lawrence County Jail. There's not a lot of hope for people right now, uh, especially with this COVID thing going on. Uh, ministers aren't allowed to go into the prisons at the moment, and when you're in a <laughs> when you're in a place like that, sometimes the only thing that you have is your Bible. Uh, you don't get letters much from uh, people on the outside, all your all your road dogs, all your all your diehard uh, family, and uh, you know you'd be lucky to get you know a couple letters a bit there. But uh, thankfully, we have access to a love letter from our God, from our Father, and from our Savior to let us know that even though we have messed up, even though we have fallen short, even though that. Everyone else in the world has given up on us. We know that God is ever faithful and ever true. I was born here in uh, Bedford, Indiana. I was born uh, when it was uh, BREMC, when it was much smaller. You were actually able to have uh, a child. I think Dunn Memorial was, was still operating, that uh, was back then. Um, I was born to my mother. Uh, she was 17 years old, didn't know my father. Until I was 32 years old, uh, someone had found him on Facebook out of 158 Byron C. Browns. They picked one Byron C. Brown, and that just happened to be my father. And I met him uh, at the age of 32. But when I was, uh, when my mother was pregnant with me, uh, her is getting a little deep. Let's just say that uh, when I was born, I was supposed to go to another family because. In, uh, I was born in 1977, so I was born in the latter part of the 70s when there was still a still a, a, a real moral fiber, a moral fiber of conservatism, and then there was still the the the, the left wing liberals as we have today, still both the same, really the same type of belief systems. But uh, in the 70s and early 80s, you know, we uh, the conservatives had more of a more of a mainstream in the, in the way that. Homes were ran, you know, I'm sure a lot of people here can remember those days. Simpler days, easier days. But uh, my mother just had me, and a nurse came into the room. It was, I don't know, I was, probably, I was probably only three or four hours old. And a nurse came in and uh, told my mother that there was a family in the waiting room waiting to take me to their home. My... Uh, one of my family members had gotten my mother to sign adoption papers um, when she was still, uh, that was before like epidurals and stuff like that, she was still on a heavy amount of uh, pharmaceuticals from the doctor from the birth. And uh, from the story that my mother tells me that she got up, just had a child and marched herself right into that, right into that waiting room or, or wherever they were standing in. My grandmother was standing there and uh, some other family members were standing there and there was this couple standing there and she, my mom went over and her drugs just gave birth state and grabbed the, the, the papers and threw them down and said, this is my child and I'm not going to let him go. And to me, that was the very, very first time I have ever experienced the love of God because that is what he does for us every single day of our life. When he calls down to us and he, he reaches down into the depths that we put ourselves into. Right. 
He says, this is my child. Right. The world's not going to take you. The world's not going to lead you down this way. I want to save your life. And I want you to come home to me. And I want to take care of you. And I want to teach you. See, my God is my father. Amen. He's somebody that... Oh, that when he looks at it, he doesn't see all the mistakes. I've made so many mistakes in my life. And we're going to get into a few of them here in just a little bit. <laughs> and when I give my testimony, I, I don't want to draw too much attention to any certain sin in my life. I don't want, and it's not that I'm ashamed of my sin or anything like that. Because we're all sinners, right? right. We're all fallen short. Right. We're, all, we're all imperfect. But I don't want to glorify it what I've come from. What I want to glorify is a God who said, I can bring you out of that and I yes. can set you yes. on a solid rock and I can take you away from the things that, that keep dragging you down. Amen. Um, I was adopted by, uh, by Rocky. I call him my dad. Uh, Rocky Riggle, he owns the, the auto shop over there. He's worked on a lot of your guys' vehicles, I'm sure. Uh, my grandparents uh, had the uh, had the faith bill uh, junkyard out there. There are those junkyards been closed now for for a very long time. Um, and we lived in a bunker right down the right down the road from Hilltop. And I don't tell a lot of people this. I don't know why I'm telling you guys in front of a church, in front of a in front of whatever uh, audience we got going on here. But um, when I was seven years old, we were living in a bunker. We there was this hill, and there's this big walnut tree over here, and there were some pear trees down here. And we had uh, those. Uh, it's not Buckeyes, but uh, it looks like a Buckeye, but it's in a, like a spiny shell. Head job? Uh, no, it's not head job. It's got the same kind of thing, uh, same kind of thing as a Buckeye. Chestnut, chestnut I think. Yeah. yeah, chestnut. We had a chestnut tree. It was a pretty cool little spot. And I remember it was a summer day, and I was running around outside playing being bored. You know, um, I'm not really sure where my brothers were. I think that they were with uh, our dad going somewhere, probably looking at cars or something like that. And it was just me and my mom. My mom was inside taking a shower. And I remember playing around outside and I just heard this. I heard someone say, Jason. Very, very distinctly in my ears, in my head. But it wasn't like it was around. It was, like, it was almost like it was in my soul. Scared me to death. <laughs> you know, it's like when you hear, when you read about Eli here and Hearing God say Eli, and he's like, "What's right. going on?" So he runs. So he runs to it, or Samuel. And he runs to Eli. He says, "Hey, did you call for me?" He said, "No." He did it three times. I mean, I can just imagine the fear that this little kid had. And I'm not saying that I'm like this big prophet or anything like that. All I'm saying is, is I truly, truly believe in my heart that God utterly spoke my name that day, running around. I even I remember just like it was yesterday. I ran inside the house. To look around to see if my brothers were like playing a trick over here or something like that. But it was like a deep man's voice. And again, as, like I said, it scared me to death. You know, you see a lot of these guys that are doing like these glory clouds and, and feathers and jewels and, and all of this stuff. And I'm telling you, every time that I've ever read the Bible or with this experience when I was seven and later on again, when I was nine years old, I heard, I heard it again when I was out in the middle of the Hoosier National Forest down in Southern Huron. And I heard that same voice again, and it scared me to death again, and I just ran through the woods. I've, I mean, in my mind now that when I remember it, it's, it's like I was running for miles and miles and miles, just scared to death back to the house. But you see, you hear these people nowadays that say that God came down into their church, or God came down in, into their area that, and, and made a manifestation of a form. All I heard was a voice, and it scared me to death. Right. And if God's going to come down in a mist, or, or in a light, or or anything like that, I'm, I'm gonna say you're probably gonna be like Daniel or or like John who 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 like the John who walked with the Savior, who walked with him in the flesh, and when he came to him on, on the Patmos, it said that he fell in fear. Yes. And fell to his face. I think in the church today we need to we need to get a real reverence for God again. A real fear of God because he's he's a consuming fire. Amen. He's not something that not something to be trifled with. <laughs> He's also a God of love and mercy, which is printed all over my life. When I was uh, 16 years old, so I, I met a, a group of hippies <laughs> in the middle of the woods. <laughs> Dreadlocks. <laughs> they smelled terrible. But it was something different. You know, I'm from Bedford, Indiana. You know, it was so wild, man. These guys are nuts. They got all these colorful clothes on. They had all these 
crazy pants and I took off with them. And my mom was not happy. My mom was not happy at all. Uh, ran around with, uh, ran around on different uh, musical tours, such as like the Grateful Dead and Fish and things like that. Learned a lot of really, really, really bad skills in life. Right. I always tell people I've been to jail more states than most people have been to. My uh, rap sheet uh, stretches from uh, uh, Oneida County, New York, to San Francisco, California, and uh, I got the rap sheet to prove it. Oh, it's terrible. But the whole time. The whole time I'm running around, I'm hitchhiking. I've, I've hitchhiked through every state except Hawaii and, Ala or, yeah, Hawaii and Alaska. And I put myself in some really, really crazy predicaments. You know, things where I, I should have mentally lost my mind through, through psychedelic use. Well, how many kids in here, right? Yeah, not too many. <laughs> <laughs> they just, and just a plethora of drugs and just fulfilling the flesh in every, in every way, shape, or form that I can think of. And then I'm also walking on, on down, the, down the interstates of the United States of America with my thumb out. Right. You know, and even in the even in the '90s, it was still not super guys to be doing that sort of thing, right. especially around the Arkansas area. <laughs> uh -huh. Very strange. But in that that whole time, that whole time, looking back on my life, I can see where God had had His hand, His extended grace and an extended mercy, and His sovereignty over my life. That even though I had really no idea because I was raised up in a church that didn't speak about the Holy Spirit, didn't speak about power. Didn't, I mean, they spoke about the resurrection, but it was, a, it was more of a resurrection that was in the distance past that it happened one time. You know, yeah, yeah, we're all going to rise up and we're all going to rise up at the end, but, it, but none of it seemed real. They didn't make it real. They didn't make it personal. So that, so I, I didn't know anything about God. I didn't know that that you could have a relationship with this God, with this with this being, with this ultimate Creator. I didn't even know what an ultimate Creator was. I went to church pretty much through my entire adolescent life, and I couldn't tell you anything about Jesus. Come on. Anything. I couldn't tell you not one thing about Jesus. I couldn't tell you. Somebody asked me if I was saved. I remember going to a church camp. And all these kids went up. You know, when you got, you got the 12 year olds coming up and they're, they're confessing Christ as their Lord and Savior. I didn't do that because no one explained it to me. No one explained what it meant to be saved or be born again or, or what repentance was or, or even what sin was. Right. I, wrote, I went up my whole life and didn't even know what sin was. So I'm going through all my teens and all my 20s just high gear, hair on fire. Uh, they used to call me Dash back in the day because I was very, very fast at every single thing that I did. And I would be sitting at your house. I don't know, I'd be like 20, 21. I'd be sitting at your house. Four hours later, I'm calling you from Arkansas. They're like, hey, man, I'm on my way to California. And they're like, what are you doing going there for? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> but so I go, to these, I go to these festivals and I go to these... I go to these gatherings that I go to them like just where there's just a plethora of religious ideas. It reminds me of uh, when Paul was at Mars Hill. And it said that these people are always looking for something new. Always uh, looking, talk to us about something new, something that something that we can dig into. And that's why everywhere I went, that's what it was. I heard some of the craziest craziest ideas of where we come from, why we're here. And they tried to complicate it. They tried to super simplify it. Uh, not very many evolutionists I didn't run into when I, was, when I was running with that crowd. Everybody kind of believed in some sort of creator. Um, I grew dreadlocks. I was searching for some sort of identity outside of myself. So I grew my dreadlocks out. I had about down to here. Um, I claimed Rastafari as my religion for the longest time. When I went to jail in New York, that's actually what I put down as my religion. And they were like, how do you spell that? <laughs> I was like, I really don't know. <laughs> like, but well, what's it about? I was like, I don't know. It's a lot of marijuana and some reggae music. That's about as far as I, as far as my understanding goes. But what it was is just I had this hole in my heart that God puts in everyone's heart. Yes. 
And it was just, it was calling out to something. It's calling out to something that, that I did, that I and myself didn't know what I was calling out to. In Isaiah, and I didn't give you this scripture because um, I don't know the answer to it, but it says, deep calleth to deep. There's something deep inside of your spirit, deep inside of your heart that longs to be connected with something greater than ourselves. Yes. Yeah. My whole life, I sought after a, a mind expansion. I sought after any way that I could get from this plane of reality to this plane of reality. And in all of these situations in my life that I put myself into, living on the streets, living in the woods, um, becoming, a, becoming a, a, a needle junkie for... 20 years. I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you really when I first started that. It just kind of happened. Come on, bro. Because when you start feeding your flesh, you just feed it. Right. And you feed it. Right. And then you feed it. And this gets old. So you feed it with this. And then this gets old. And you feed it with this. And you're just constantly hungry and constantly thirsty. Yeah. That's why Jesus said, He said, He said, If anybody thirst, yeah. come to me. But how will they not know if they do not hear? The word, and how will they hear that? How will they hear the word if they are not sent a preacher? Right. So in all these crazy areas in, in the world that I've been, God always put some crazy fanatical Christian <laughs> around me. <laughs> and where I come from in, in the whole hippie world, you can believe in anything in the world. I mean anything. You believe in aliens, you can believe in a rock, you can believe in a worm is God, and you can believe in anything. But just don't say the name of Jesus. Wow. Come on. Do not say. And I remember being on the Hate Mash Ferry in San Francisco, and they, we had what we called the Jesus House. It was it was down on uh, I can't even remember the name of the road now, it's been so long ago. But uh, it was just there was nothing but a, a bunch of uh, reformed hippie Christians. You couldn't tell from the outside other than they took a bath. That's how you can distinguish them from the other hippies. But, but there was just something about them. They just had this glow about them. Their clothes didn't change, but their faces changed. Yeah, come on. The way that they walked changed. The way that they talked changed. The way that they spoke with people. And no longer are they worried about getting their fixes, but they're, they're worried about getting you fixed up with him so that you don't have to live where you've been living. Right. And they're going to drive you crazy with it. So either you leave the street or you get saved. And I actually picked up that type of a type of a mentality here in the last few years. That there's times in my life that people just keep coming at me, keep coming at me. So I just keep telling them about Jesus. Oh. You're either going to leave me yeah. alone or you're going to get saved. Right. That's your two things. Yeah. I would rather you get saved, but if you leave me alone, that's fine too. But I reckon you get saved. Amen. Amen. The word tells us that it, the sun rises on the just and the unjust. Yes. It sets on the just and the unjust. It rains, meaning that someone who is walking with Christ has problems and someone who isn't has their problems as well. So I remember being on the hate. This, this girl would always walk by me and she'd be like this. She'd be like, they see Jesus' name. And they just keep walking, man. And just touch the top of my head. It would drive me insane, man. It was like, finally I stopped her one day. And I said, why do you keep doing that? She's like, I just... She, <clears throat> she said, you scare me. <laughs> She's like, because you're always just so high on drugs all the time. And you are a very intimidating person. So... She, the way she, and I can't even believe like God is just flooding me right now with this memory. I haven't thought about this in a long time. She said, I'm battling my fear of judgment towards people because I've seen how high you are and I don't want to talk to you because you're so high and you're scary. So the only thing that I can bring myself to do is to touch the top of your head and say, bless you in Jesus' name. <laughs> and then I'm going to walk off real quick. I was like, what is she talking about? <laughs> So I go through all of those. Uh, I went. I was in a. Uh, I was at a, a gathering down in Florida, and uh, the first time I ever ran into like uh, a whole camp, there was probably fifty people that were what they called themselves Jesus freaks. It was a spawn from the uh, the seventies, 
movement of Jesus Freaks. They were trying to carry that, carry that on. And I remember I was just so hungry. And I hadn't ate forever. I helped set up, set up the gathering and stuff like that. And I don't, maybe I was just on too many drugs. I just didn't eat. I don't remember. But I remember going up, and there was just like this giant cross, man, out in the middle of the Ocala National Forest. I just had like they were just setting up their camp, and it's just, I mean, I was like I said, I was on a lot of drugs, but it seemed just so huge, man. It just seemed like it was just glowing and. And I just kind of followed it, and I come to this camp, and the first thing this person does is hands me this bowl of soup. There's a like a tin bowl. It says, "If you're hungry, you can come back for more." I said, "Okay," and I still didn't really know what was up. But see, Christians are tricky. Yeah. <laughs> They'll jar you with some food. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you look like you ain't ate in about four days. Yeah. They're like, "Come on, man, we'll give you some some of this." And then we'll give you some bread of life. Well, they tricked me and they got me to sit down. And that's the first time I remember hearing John 3.16. But the greatest thing about hearing John 3.16 the first time is that they also put in John 3.17. Yes. Which a lot of people don't put in there. Yes. Because it's scary. Come on. <laughs> Pretty much it says, John 3.16, of course we all know, says for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that he shall ever should believe in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him does, is not condemned. This is the scary part. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Yeah. So that's without all the drugs. That's without all the sin. That's without, if you just don't believe in Jesus, you're condemned. That freaked me out. Freaked me out so much to the point that I left the gathering. Like, I'd only been there for like four days. It was supposed to be almost a month long. I was gone. I was like, this whole God thing. Like, what it was is God came down and he touched me that night. Come on. And he touched my heart. Yeah. And he touched my mind. And he touched my eyes. But I, and I believe it's, uh, it's either in Romans or 1 Corinthians, it says that, a carnal man and a carnal mind is enmity against God. Yes. Meaning we war like without being converted, without being born again. We are enemies of God. It sounds really harsh. But it's so true. Yeah. I wanted nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with that. So I go to jail in California. I don't know how many times. I go to jail in New York. I go to jail in Baton Rouge. I go to jail in Florida Keys. Uh, to the cupcake camp. <laughs> I just remembered that too. <laughs> but I've been there. It's just been a really rough time. I came back to Bedford in 1998, 7, 8, something like it. 97, I Chad. That's where I met Chad. I, uh, I was dating uh, one of his, it was your step, yeah. stepsister, yes. I was dating his stepsister, and uh, it's funny that she said that thing about Greg Locke, because um, me and him were in the same boat on the marriage thing. But uh, we went out to California together, and we came back, and uh, things didn't work out. And uh, she had a she had a little boy named Britton. He was two years old when we split up. Uh, had a couple warrants. I went to jail in 2000 and, and here in Lawrence County Jail and met a man named Dyrus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people know Dyrus. Yes, sir. And I remember it telling the story of the prodigal son. The very first message that I really ever really truly heard when he said that that the son was living in slop starving to death stinking clothes Mom. running around with a bunch of people that he normally wouldn't run around with doing things that he normally wouldn't do you know Paul talks about uh, when, we're, when we're living in the when we're caught up in the flesh, when we're trying to serve Christ, when we're caught up in the flesh, sometimes there's things in our lives that we're going to 
that we're going to try not to do, but without the power of Christ, you're going to end up doing them anyway. Right. It says, I tried, I tried to do good. And, and so many times in my life, I, in my own power, in my own strength, I tried to do good. I truly have tried to do good. But without goodness living inside of me, without goodness transforming me, without goodness showing me what good really is, I fall short of it and I fail at it every time. Yes. But I love to serve a merciful God. Yes. So I meet Dyrus. I uh, meet a brother named Corey Reynolds, which I'll probably tag him in this in this video later. And uh, we're all uh, we're all rolling, <coughs> we're all rolling uh, holiness style. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what you did back there. You got out of Lawrence County. Yeah. And when I first got out, I went. Uh, I remember all these stories that I heard about people getting out of jail or wearing these old man clothes that they just got out from one of the preachers and stuff. So I said, I want to be just like that. See, what I started began to do is I started to started to try to model myself after other Christians. And nowhere in the Bible does it. Well, I guess I, I can't say that because Paul said, "Follow after me as I follow after Christ." But you. But you follow, if you are going to follow after someone, make sure that that person is following after Christ to a T. My, my personal opinion is that if you're going to begin to follow after Christ, do that. Yes. Follow yes. after Christ. Read your Bible and pray. But I tried to start, I tried to start modeling myself after other Christians. And I read the Bible, I got, man, I read the Bible cover to cover like seven times. You know, and the, and the problem with that is, is that you start intellectualizing God. Right. And that's what I did. I intellectualized God. Like, I knew a lot about God. Like, I could read a, I could read a, a, a biography on, on Jimi Hendrix or read a biography on, on uh, Charles Finney or, or anybody. You, you can read all these biographies and you can read about their lives, but you don't know the person. Right. And that's where I was at when, when I first got out of jail in 2001. I come out of firecracker. I came out, I got my old old man clothes, I got my, my long coat, and got my handful of tracks and my King James. I started going right over on, uh, actually right around the area that I live at now, and I started knocking on doors and telling people about the good news. And uh, I remember my very first door I knocked on, I got screamed at by an old man that says, I told you we ain't buying nothing. I was like, I ain't trying to sell nothing. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm trying to tell you about Jesus. Well, I don't care about Jesus either. And slammed the door in my face. The very first door I knocked on. <laughs> oh. But it didn't deter me. But it didn't deter me not because I was this hardcore, spirit-filled Christian. Because I didn't even know what that was. I, I didn't get deterred because I knew other people had done it. So I kept going. I kept going. Uh, I'll say about four months and I'm going to try to speed this up. Uh, there's just a couple spots that I really want to hit because I want to show God's mercy in my life. Uh, about four months after that, uh, I was preparing a message to go to the Bliss House uh, to preach. And I get a phone call. And uh, they tell me that uh, that little boy who's uh, four years old at the, at the time of the phone call would, had been uh, murdered. I remember going to his funeral. And I remember um, a couple of his kid folk from uh, the Nashville area, Tipsy area, was up there. We were cold verses back and forth. Again, it's all just rehearsed. It's all just memory verses. God really isn't concerned about how many memory verses right. you know. Right. He's really more concerned about how many verses that transform your heart and your mind and bring you closer to Him. Amen. And I remember as they were taking them out to Bridesville Church, and we went out there and we were putting them into the ground. And I remember that preacher, I couldn't even tell you who that preacher was now. I remember he, I mean, it was like it, it was like the people split, like the Red Sea. And he pointed right at me and said, Don't give up! God ain't done with you yet, don't give up! And I remember. Leaving that, leaving that place, leaving that graveside. And instead of hitting my knees, 
Like I've been telling everybody else to do when I'm ministering to them. Oh, if you got troubles, hit your knees. If you got troubles, pray to God. If you got troubles, read your Bible. If you got troubles, get a hold of one of your Christian family, Christian friends, Christian brothers and sisters. I did none of those things. Absolutely none of them. I went straight to Papa's. And for a long time, and this may be shocking to hear, especially coming from this area. I'm just going to be real with you. I'm going to be transparent with you because I want to show you God's love and God's mercy. As I became very, very, very angry at God. I blamed God for the things that happened in Britain. I blamed God for things in my life that were going on with me that I caused. 100% I caused. But just like Adam and Eve, it wasn't me, it was the woman you gave me. What wasn't me, it was the snake that you, that you made. You know? Just blaming everybody else but myself. And I spent the next 11 years basically trying to kill myself. Uh, doing everything I could to rebel against God. It's not that I that it's not that I wanted to go to hell or anything like that. I just didn't want anything to do with God. But still he pursued me. Yeah. Still he yeah. sought after me. Yeah. Still. I can still I can remember today how many times I should have been dead. Yeah. I should have been dead. But he said, I'm going to give you one more breath. Because all breath is going to one day confess Him as Lord and Savior. I'm going to give you a chance again yeah. to do it. And guess what? I failed again. He said, I'm going to give you another breath yeah. to be able to praise my name and praise, uh, praise my sons. And we'll give you another breath yeah. for 11 years. Mom. But I was running and I was running and I was running. I got called at a very young age to do what I'm doing here today. And I ran from it. I ran from it. Come on. I didn't want nothing to do with it. Finally, in 2013, I was arrested for meth, the manufacturing of methamphetamine. A big felony. That's before they went to this whole level thing. I remember getting thrown in there and I didn't get arrested. I got rescued. That yeah. really was a rescue net for me. Come on. Now I remember I, they put me in the, uh, the safe cell because I was just so whacked out. They didn't know what to do with me. So they put me in the safe cell. And I, remember, I don't even know how long it'd been, but I remember doing push ups trying to convince the, the nurse to let me go up in the population because I was going to lose my mind in there. But I remember as they were bringing me in, I remember I was rebelling against God for like 11 years. And they bring me in, and I go up to the up to the little the little station there where you do your fingerprints and all that stuff. And they said, "What do you want?" And just something inside of me said, "I want a Bible." So he gives me this Bible. They stick me in the sex cell. I remember opening up this Bible, and I remember opening up the Genesis in it, and I remember reading three words in the beginning. And I remember just losing it, just crying because. It's like I can read the words, and it's just three words. It's three words of the, the very first three words of the whole book. But it's like God just started flooding me with all of this stuff, showing me that He loved me. And I remember getting on my knees, and I remember looking up at the, at the ceiling, going, God, if you're really this God who loves me, you're really this God that, that Dyrus told me about, that Corey told me about, that, that these different preachers have told me about, these hippies have told me about. If you're really this God that loves me, will you show me? Woo. Come on. And I tell you, the, the alcoholics called a white light on the man of God come down in there. He come down in that cell. And I remember just hitting my face. And I remember just confessing. And I didn't even know what really what confessing truly was. But it was coming from my heart. It was coming from my soul. And I remember I got changed that night. Yeah. You know, Hebrews talks about tasting of the, of, of the glory of God and, and the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, tasting of it. And that's what I was getting. I was getting this taste. They lost my paperwork. The courts did. For 60 days. And you got 62 days to get a lawyer. I remember writing letters, writing letters, writing letters to the public defender's office. And, and God finally told me uh, after about day 32... He said, stop writing letters. And he gave me Exodus 14, 14, be still and let God fight your battles. Wow. So I just stopped and I stopped writing. They gave me a lawyer out in Bloomington for free. 
when I came back down from my modification two years later, the, the courts had never even heard of this lawyer. They didn't know where she was from. They didn't know where her firm was. They, to them, she didn't exist. Now, I remember she came in, looked like she just came off a of vacation. She had sunglasses on. It was all burnt around here. She said, well, what do you want him to do? Because they had sent me. I, I've been reading the Bible. I've been praying. I've been going to every church service I could for five months. Before she came to the come to the courtroom that day with an offer or asking me what I, what I wanted, so I'm like super on fire for Christ. I'm super on. I've been changed in the segregation cell, kind of like Reno Bates and the, all them, you know, back in the day. And then I get a letter from the the prosecutor that said, 10 years executed cap." <laughs> Talk about a deflate. Yeah. <laughs> But I remember I was just, I was like, God, you told me. Exodus 14, 14, you told me. You told me, you told me. So I just, I put it down. And then I, she come to see me. She said, what do you want to do? I was like, tell them I'll take the 10 years. I was like, but I want six do three to spend four. And she said, okay, I'll go tell them. She comes back and said, that's fine. You can do that. <laughs> so I get, so I get, I get sent to the farm. I was always tell people it's like the armpit of DOC. Yeah. <laughs> it was rough. Super rough. Multiple games, drugs galore. But man, God blessed me in that place. You know, uh, Pastor was talking about the other day how he turned it into a seminary school. And truly for two years and yeah. two months, yeah. that's what I did. Yeah. There was a, uh, in the chapel, they had this little brick chapel. Man, if you ever been to the farm, it's... It's just this little bitty building, man. But man, I tell you what, God moved in that place. When you go to a prison church service, and you're with a bunch of people that know exactly what they are, that they know exactly what God's brought them from, you will see a move of God yeah. in a place like yeah. you have never, ever, ever seen before in your life. Yeah. And when I got out of there, that's what I was looking for. When I got out here on the streets. Unfortunately, though, we tend to forget who we are outside of Christ. Sometimes we forget that come even on, though that we were on, addicted to drugs or adulterers or, or cheaters or thieves or murderers, you know, God didn't forgive us of that much. But we've all been set, we all been separated since the garden from God. Our relationship has been stained since the garden with God. So no matter who you are or what you've done or what you haven't done. You're still saved from the pits of hell. You're still saved from a... You're still reunited with the God who loves you, who created you in His own image. That when it comes down to it, we're all the same. Yes. We're all sinners saved by grace. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I remember getting out of... Getting out of... Mm, I remember being in prison. And they got these little yellow lines. You're not supposed to walk on the outside of those lines. You're, Go to chow, go to chapel or wherever. And I remember uh, they all called me preacher. Remember some uh, some six point gangsters were over here on the other side of the yard as we're going to chow like this. And they're like, "Hey, preacher, man, did you pray for my grandma?" So I just I, I run across the yard, <laughs> and this is like you get pepper ball and everything, man. Nobody said nothing. Nobody seen nothing. I went over there, I prayed for him, go back over to my side, go a few, 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 now this didn't happen every single day, but on a good day it did. Uh, we'd, be, uh, we'd be walking in and somebody else would holler, I'd run across there, nobody said nothing, nobody said anything. I remember they would let me go into uh, different dorms, which is unheard of. Never got searched, never got anything, just to go pray with people. The chaplain would call me down to do grief counseling because I lost Britain. I knew, the, I knew the pain of loss. Come on. Um, but God was just evident in that place. We did 24 hour prayer vigils. But I remember we prayed and fasted so we could have a prayer meeting yeah. <laughs> in the chapel yeah. during the day. Yeah. Come on. You know, praying and fasting and pray some more. It's awesome. Uh, just uh, violence all around. Violence all around. There was about six of us. That were that were all together. We called her, we're like the many disciples, and uh, God just protected us, man. I mean, there was about to be a race riot right there in our dorm, 
and just all six of us sat right there in the middle. There's, there's Caucasians here and everyone else over here, and we're sitting right in the middle reading our Bibles and singing our hymns and, and discussing back and forth and while the entire door was getting ready to erupt and in chaos. We just sat there and read our Bibles and nobody said anything. Nobody came to us. Nobody came around us. We we're just known as the Christians. <laughs> and God really, really, really blessed us. I read one last prison story and I'll jump off into what we're doing now. Uh, I remember going up to RDC and there was about eight of us in the band. And I was sitting there saying, like, because I didn't know any Christian contemporary songs at that time. I mean, I've been running from God for 11 years. So I just knew some hymns that we'd been singing in Lawrence County Jail, you know. So I'm singing those the whole way up. You got these younger cats, it's their first time in prison too. And they're cutting up, they're being all tough and stuff like that. And until we pulled up to RDC, and they yeah. seen the Constantine wires. And then all the joking stopped. <laughs> all the laughter stopped. And everybody just went. And they said, Rue, then why aren't you freaking out? It's like, because I have God. Amen. I have the protection of God. Amen. Yes, I'm going to prison. Yes, I've done some bad things in my life, but my God has forgiven me. My God has redeemed me. And my God is going to protect me because that's what his word says. Amen. And that's what I'm standing on. Yeah, amen. They thought I was crazy. <laughs> so two and a half years I get out. Again, though, you start off real good. You start off real on fire. You start off with an actual relationship with him, with Christ and with, and with the Father, and you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Next thing you know, you, you get a job out here. See, in prison, you can read your Bible 10 to 12 hours a day. Right. You can pray 24 hours a day. Right. When you get out here in the real world, you got jobs, and you got family, you got yeah. kids, you got you got life. Yeah. So your eight hours a day of Bible reading turns into about 15 minutes. Yeah, come on. And uh, me and Brother Chad were talking about one day, and, oh. I, and I missed a couple Sundays here and there because of work. You got to work, you're tired. Next thing you know, you miss a Sunday. Next thing you know, you miss the following Wednesday. Next thing you know, oh. the next Sunday happens. Next thing you know, you're drunk. You're doing something that you ain't yeah, supposed to be doing. On. You're not definitely not praising God. You're definitely not worshiping God. You're definitely not showing God in your life to people. And they say, no, go back to the same old same old. Where you, where you lost, pretending to be a Christian, that's between you and God. Where you saved and then lost your salvation, that's between your Bible study and your God. But I do know that no matter what I've gone through in my life, it's always been there. Has he approved of everything that I've done in my life? No. Has he protected me in all of my stupidity and all of my ignorance? Yes. Yes, he has. Yeah, come on. Here recently, I lost my brother. You know, I got, I, would, I relapsed. Went to jail for 60 days. Got out. Uh, rededicated my life. Uh, for about, I lost about two and a half years. Uh, my brother went to hopefully be with the Lord. Come on. Um, Come from on. the Lawrence County Drunk Tank. Come on. Um, the disease of alcohol nope. took him along with uh, a heart, massive heart attack. Nope. <clears throat> I lasted about two months after that. Because no matter how close you think you are to the Father, there's always going to be that one eye. Right? That's what, that's what Jesus said to the church of Ephesus. I've got one out against you. I've got one more thing that you can do. I've got one more, one more, one more thing that you, can, that you can give over to me that I can bestow upon you to take the place of what you have given him. He does a little trade thing. If you're insecure, if you're afraid, you can give that to him. He'll give you power and security. But again, I... I didn't seek counsel. There's a counsel. There's a counsel. Counsel in the multitudes. Yeah. Iron sharpens iron. God says things in the Bible, not just to hear Himself talk. Right. There's good reasons for it. Every right. single word in this in this book, there's a reason for it. Even Second Chronicles, the thirteen chapters of names. 
Right. There's a reason for it. <laughs> right. You know, whether it's to go to sleep or whatever. <laughs> Drink a lot of water. <laughs> But uh, I faltered and I, I failed. I tried to hide it. I tried to, uh, you know, my wife knew, of course. My kids definitely knew, you know. And so I stepped away from the ministry. I stepped away from my responsibilities of anything besides drinking. That's the only thing I, and I kept my job. I don't know how I did that. But I kept my job and I, I, I fell into self-pity. Wallow around in it, you know. Second Peter uh, reiterates Proverbs where it says that the pig turns back to its to its slop, and the dog eats its vomit. That's exactly what I needed. Yeah. Right back to it. Yeah. Come on. And I remember I, within within all of that, God dealing with me, God dealing with me. You know, the Holy Spirit never leaving me alone, always convicting me, always convicting me, never stop convicting me, which. Made my flesh react even more than enmity against God that we were talking about earlier. I kept just trying to fight it, trying to fight it. Come on. You know, I vow I'll never sit in the pulpit again, never preach again. But it's like Jeremiah says, even though I tried to stop saying his name, it was like fire in my yeah. bones. Yeah. And I could not help yeah. but to say his name. I remember getting baptized in a pool of Mitchell. But I was a, I was a dry sinner, then I was a wet sinner. Come on. Come on. I didn't repent. I didn't change. I might have changed for about a week. You know? When guys get out of jail and they're on fire and, you know, they're sober and stuff, you know, I, I, I hate to say it, it sounds, it sounds kind of coarse, but I've been that person before. Give them about two months, about 60, 60 to 90 days. We'll see how you're doing in 60 to 90 days. I don't want to. You know, I don't want to damper your fire, and I definitely don't want to don't want to get you to doubt your relationship. But I won't see you here in about sixty or ninety days, and let's talk about where you're at. Most of the time, you don't get that conversation in sixty or ninety days. Sometimes you do, right? Because we're growing up in a. I grew up, let's say that I grew up, and maybe some of you have too. We're growing up in a time and a situation and in, in a type of Christianity to where if we do things. And God will love us more. Or if we do things, God will protect us more. But the Bible tells us that we were dead in sin. That he died for us. Yeah. That even though we were completely separate enemies against God, he loves us. Yeah, we are to do things. But not so that we get favoritism. Or that we can... Work for our salvation or, or to stay saved. We do it because we love them. Right. I go and I get I get flowers for my wife, not because I think the flowers are gonna keep her, but because I love her. You know, I, I went and I got some I got some of those airplane shooter airplane things from the dollar store last night for the kids, mainly so they'll go outside and get off the video games, but not so that they'll still stay my children. But because I love them. Right. I want to see them doing something. You know, God gives us things, you know, in our lives, not because he loves us anymore or he loves us because we're, 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 we are his children. Yes. He loves us. That's true. He loves us a lot. It's true. But in all the times, in all the mistakes, you know, it's one thing I love about Reno, you know, I've, I've, come, from, I've come from a lot of hurt in the church and I've come from a lot of, a lot of pain in the church. Reno loves us. Reno has a real heart for God. He has a real heart for people. And I hate to say it, you can't find that in a lot of places anymore. Wow. At least not where I've been. But one thing that I have learned, though, is that just because just you think that there's one bad seed doesn't mean it's all bad. Right. Right. If you've been to a church and you've been hurt before, it doesn't mean they're all like that. Just right. because one Christian's turned his back on you, and maybe they didn't even talk about you, maybe they didn't even, even backed up bad conversations about you instead of trying to lift you up and trying to say, hey, he's been redeemed as well. Just like you, he's been redeemed. Yes. Even when they don't do that, you still have a God who's not going to give up on you. Hallelujah. 
I don't know if it's in, I don't know if it's in here tonight or if it's in, in, if it's in the camera world is what I call it, video world. But someone's failed a lot, and instead of hearing the hearing the words of truth, saying that He is the Redeemer, He is the one who makes all things new. Instead of listening to that, you're listening to your failures, you're listening to the enemy, you're listening to those around you that say that you're never going to be anything, that you're never going to be back to where you were before. I never want to be the Christian that I was before. Amen. Ever. Amen. I want to be the Christian that I don't even know that I can be. Yes, amen. That comes with surrender. Pastor Reno said that about the, the sheep. You know, the, the shepherd knocking the knees of the sheep and throwing them up on his shoulders. God's had to do that to me so many times. Oh. He's never gave up on me. Amen. He's never gave up on you. He will never give up on you. He will chase you to the gates of hell if that's what it takes to turn you around. And he will allow you to put yourself through as much hell as it takes till you get on your knees and you look up and you say, God, save me. Yeah. Please, God, save me. And if that's you tonight, I ask that tonight be the night that you give your heart to Christ. Amen. If tonight you're the person who's thinking to yourself, I'm never going to be who I'm supposed to be. If you've tried so hard and you've looked so much in your life, just give it over to Him and ask Him to show you, ask Him to lead you, ask Him to guide you. Amen. So man, I'm just not a I'm just a drug addict, I'm just a jail bird, I'm just an adulterer. No, no, no. Mm. You are and can be a child of God. Yes. All you have to do is turn from it and say, God, here I am. Use me. Yes. Use me. Save me. Wow. So if he can do it for a 20 plus year junkie, he can do it for you as well. Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the time that you have given to for me to show your love towards me, your deliverance that you've given me in my life. And Father, I ask for all of those that are that are wandering, all those that are thirsty, all those that are hungry, all those that just want to come closer to you. Maybe they're saved. Maybe they they just don't have someone to guide them. Lord Father, I pray that you will put someone in their path. Give them an elder. Give them a spiritual father. We are lacking spiritual fathers in this nation. We are lacking those who want to teach the younger. Like the Bible says, teach the younger to bring them up in the word of God. Lord, we need preachers. We need teachers. We need husbands and wives standing on the firm foundation of the word of God for you today. In a world that wants nothing to do with you. Amen. Yes. Father, empower us, your children. Empower those that are falling short. But empower those, open the eyes of those who are blinded by regrets, by mistakes, by the past. And push them into the future with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. Hey, give him a big hand. Amen. Wow. I know. Uh, and Jason, I really appreciate that. Uh, this is just a little index card. You guys can't see it. But these are the things that uh, they they mean a lot to me. I, I have a I have an odd way of preparing messages and taking notes. I mean, they're normally on napkins or envelopes, but uh, these are things that I just garnered out of what Jason had to say tonight because of. Even in the similarities that we might have in our testimony, there are always things uh, that are so different, so inspiring. And so, brother, I'm inspired to know that we still serve a God that when Dash was still running, <laughs> God was still pursuing. Amen. Uh, Amen. That he never gives up on us, that he never quits. And how perfectly illustrated that we serve a God that will chase us to the very gate of hell. To forgive us, to love us. Amen. I don't know about you, but I haven't heard that out of Allah. I haven't heard that out of Buddha. <laughs> I haven't heard that out of a lot of other gods that a lot of people serve. But I've heard it over time and time and time and time again. 
Every one of us. Your testimony may not be that you were in prison, that you spent time in the Indiana Department of Corrections, or that you traveled across the country uh, like a vagabond man, just living life. Some of you may say, man, I've never even been out of Bedford, Indiana. But do you realize you can be in Bedford, Indiana and be every bit as lost as you can be in New York City, uh, in San Francisco, California, in Tallahassee, Florida? In Montgomery, Alabama, uh, you can even go out into the Gulf of Mexico to a little place called Dauphin Island and be absolutely lost and void of God. Not void of His love, because His love is always there for you. Amen. But the relationship, the relationship is what God wants you to have with Him tonight. And uh, there was one little thing that I thought that I might have wrote down here. Uh, you all don't know this, but um, Jason, I had, you know, we have a lot in common. I spent a lot of time with my thumb out hitchhiking, uh, lived in Las Vegas, Nevada for a little while, Sin City. Uh, I've done a lot of stupidity in my life. And in all the places I've traveled, all over the country, all over the places that I've been, and I've been to a lot of different places. Done a lot of bad things that I should have been doing. I never in my life, one time in Las Vegas, Nevada, which you have to realize is close to Reno, Nevada, which is close to Carson City, which is the capital uh, of Nevada. See, most people won't know that. They think that Las Vegas is the capital. I'm teaching you something now. Carson City is the capital of Nevada. Uh, but in Las Vegas, Nevada, one time in my life, I met a guy, and his name was Reno. We just talked for a few minutes. And so I've been all over the country, all around, even outside of the United States of America, and I never met anybody else with the name Reno. It was just kind of a unique name. And then all of a sudden, one day, I'm in Bedford, Indiana, and somebody says, Hey, man, I didn't know that uh, you played in a rock band and sang. And I was like, I don't know that either. <laughs> He's like, well, ain't you playing at the bar here in town this weekend? I thought you was going to try. I was like, yeah, no, man, my pastor will kill me. <laughs> uh, he'll flip one out. Uh, and they said, oh, I don't know, that's why, you know, I was thinking, what the world is that guy talking about, you know? And so uh, I began this pursuit to try to figure out what this guy was talking about. And I found out that in the community that I lived in, in Bedford, Indiana, out of all the places in the world that I had been, and had only met one in Reno in my whole life, that in a town as small as Bedford, Indiana, there was another individual with the name Reno. And that was Jason's brother who passed away. And so, somehow, God allowed us to have a connection, even even when we didn't have a connection. And I feel like God has put Jason and Mandolin in this place to help us and to be a blessing to us. I know that he was a blessing to me. The Word of God is always a blessing. But to hear somebody else share the Word of God from their heart and their testimony has been a blessing. So with that being said, one of the things that I'd like to do is uh, here coming up uh, through the next few Wednesday nights, uh, we're going to do something different. Uh, and that's either going to be me and Somebody sitting in these chairs, you say, oh, I can't do it. I'll pass out. I can't get up there and do that. I'll help you. I'll sit right here with you. And uh, I'll help you share your testimony. Because I think one of the most important things that we can do is that we come to church with each other. We get, we, get, we see each other. We hug each other's necks. We have secret sisters. We have uh, men's ministries. We talk to each other. I mean, I know that Jay's a mechanic. And blah, 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 blah. And we have a past. And I know Debbie and Joe. And I know Chad, you know. But do we really? Do we really know people? You know, do we, how do we know people BC before Christ? Because sometimes that's an interesting thing. Not to know to point fingers or to be judgmental or critical about someone in their past, but to know that we serve a great God. That whether we've grown up and spent our whole life in a pew of a church, or whether we've grown up and spent our life in the gutter and the pew of life, God is still great and greatly to be praised. He is still in the salvation business. 
and his hope is for each and every one of us to know him and to love him as Lord and Savior. And in return, he'll bless us and love us with a love that can't explain it. Can't explain it. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. Amazing grace. For all kinds of people that have even wrote lyrics to songs that try to describe it. And that's why as Christians, when we sing those songs, we get excited, don't we? We lift our hands, sometimes we cry. We, we praise God and say, man, why am I laughing? Why am I crying? Because what I'm singing or what I'm expressing right now is coming through via the Holy Spirit. And I can't even explain it. But it feels good. Man, there is nothing like feeling the love of God Almighty in your heart and in your life. So I encourage you tonight, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please, please, see me, see Jason, see somebody. But more importantly than seeing me or seeing Jason or seeing somebody else that will pray with you, see Jesus. If you have to go into your bathroom and close the door and hide yourself away from the rest of the world, don't hide yourself from Jesus. Cry out to him and ask him, God, forgive me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And I promise you, if you'll do that, you'll need it from your heart. God will come to you in that very moment. As a matter of fact, He's already been there and you didn't even know it. Amen. And He will save you and love you with a love that is beyond compare. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, God. Well, let's pray. Let's get out of here and go to the house. Amen. What a great job. We give Jason another hand in my hand. If you feel the Lord pressing on your heart to be here next Wednesday and to be in that position, please see me before you leave because if not, I'm going to start picking people on the side. You won't like it when I do that because I'll put you on the spot. And you can't run. You say, well, I just won't come next Wednesday. That's between you and God. You'll take that with them. And when you come back on Wednesday after that, guess what? These chairs are still here. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We praise you. We thank you, God. Thank you for a wonderful testimony, Lord. Thank you, God, that even when we find ourselves in just the pit of life, Lord, what a, what a, a, a great quote in that Jason found himself in the Indiana Department of Corrections in the armpit of the Department of Corrections. Gosh, how disgusting we have allowed sin to take us in our life and how far we have allowed to take us at times. But Lord, you have been faithful to follow us even into the armpit of sin so that you could pull us out, so that you could clean us up, so that you could brush us off, and so that we could have a testimony that would glorify you and talk of your love and your mercy and your grace. And even when we have found ourselves flat on our face again, Lord, you have been there to say, my child, I still love you. Arise, my love. Arise. And just like you lifted Jesus from the tomb of death, you will lift our life back up so that we can function and have a purpose. The purpose of sharing the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, in the world that we live in. Help us to go forward from this place and to do that. To tell people about your love, about your mercy, about your grace, about your greatness. Most importantly, about your salvation. And that we don't have to die lost and spend an eternity in a devil's hell. But that we can make heaven our home. Through the way, the truth, and the life. Through your son, Christ Jesus. Oh, that's my prayer. Lord, bring revival to this church, to this community to the people that we love, to the families that we care about, to those that we don't even know who somehow, some way may impact the life of someone that we love. God, let revival begin right here in the house of God. Lord, allow our testimonies to be heard, that they lift others up and encourage others to know your son Jesus as Lord and Savior. For that, may we glorify you and give you all the praise and the thanks. For it's in his name we pray. 
Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for a great week. Now, don't forget all the covers on Tuesday night from 7 to 8.30. Come out and be a part of that. We are here every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. with Sunday school and every Sunday service at 11 a.m. Come out this week. Communion service. God bless. Have a great night.